Now, um, really without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, local historian Bob Wilder. Society started in 18, I think, 1895, uh, and uh, the, one of the first presidents, Robert Batchelder, wrote a very accurate record. I just want to read a few things so you will know and understand uh, what they went through to try and establish where this site was. It's a 334-year mystery, and I hope when you leave here today, most of you are convinced it's not. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands when this is over because politically it might not be correct. But here we go. Mr. Batchelder wrote his. Uh, Mr. Batchelder, in his, in his speech, which I have here, uh, wrote the following The fall day in 1895 fell to our good friends of New Braintree, with whom we are foregathered on October 1st. <coughs> All hands meeting at Sucker Brook below the Pepper House. You'll be going there today. And driving thence to Winnemesset Meadows. You'll be going there also. So that we might see for ourselves these two rivals for the honor of being seen a real surprise. There's actually two more spots, and I'll touch on those. At the exercise which followed in the afternoon, the topic was much booted one of where real surprise actually occurred. And it goes on to name where everybody had their opinions. And they appointed a committee to examine these spots and come back to the society with their idea of where it occurred. Now we move ahead. We don't get an answer from the committee right away. <clears throat> New Braintree is a little farm town and people move slow. So we jump ahead another couple of years. So this was a rare day, the 8th of September, 1897, and all hands turned out. I guess it was the largest procession that section of our district ever saw, and everybody was greatly surprised. It probably was no bigger than the group we got here, though. This is very impressive. Our meeting place was at the bridge of Wasucka Brook near Cooney House, and that gave us a chance to learn from the vice president the history and location of that ditch. Then the cavalcade, cavalcade took up this line of march over the hills we went and finally dropping down into the beautiful Ware River Valley. 
by Massachusetts Central Railroad, where in time we reached the site of the four acre island. Now I will expand on that significantly, and I have maps here that you don't see it. That's one of my secrets. We'll reveal it later. <clears throat> So-called Ephraim Curtis in 1675 parlayed with the Indians just a few days before Wheeler's surprise. It was but a short distance thence, through some fields, to a most romantic spot on the bank of the Ware River, where in 1675 the Indians had an important village with barns and storages of corn. I have mapped that. You will see that map, and I'll describe that map to you. Today had an added import importance in that it brought back to us the active member of our president, who was uh, the former president of. I'm sorry, the governor of South Carolina. Stand in the corner. <laughs> now, before I get going, I want to bring one man. Let me we'll bring you for a while. This is a very significant man because this is a guy, long gone, who spoke through his pages uh, to give me a clue that started this whole thing back 20 years ago when I began investigating this. I actually spent nine years working on this puzzle. So let me read you about this fellow. His name was Rufus Putnam. Now, Rufus Putnam, uh, dad died when he was seven years old. His mom remarried and he lived with his stepfather until 1753. He never got a chance to go to school. He got a job at the tavern and earned enough money to buy a musket and shot him. And he went out and he shot game, and he sold it to the tavern. And with that money, he bought books. And you know, he self-educated. He taught himself how to, how to read, uh, how to do math. But he didn't know how to write. He had never learned to find art in writing. Eventually, he joined the Army when he was 17 years old. And he learned to write in the Army. Now, this guy went on uh, to become a brigadier general and a personal friend of George Washington. That's pretty impressive. He was also the chief engineer for the Continental Army. And he designed uh, so many places that he built the defenses of Roxbury and Dorchester, uh, Brooklyn, and he set up the defenses at West Point. And you remember Major Andre from the British who got caught there? And uh, with his collusion with Benedict Arnold, and uh, they ended up hanging him. These are the plans he was after. <clears throat> now, I'm going back to Batchelder again. Uh, he talks about this gentleman uh, actually being farmed out to what is now a section of North Brookfield. He, uh, he actually uh, worked uh, for his brother-in-law. And he was denied many of the things. What he wasn't denied was an opportunity to study scenes how he bought the books. So one thing is the brother-in-law bought candles for him. So with that, I'll retire this book, and I'm going to bring back this really wonderful old book. This is an original written in 1828. Now Wheeler, who brought his uh, militia into, into this valley, uh, there are a lot of reasons why he shouldn't have done this. A lot of reasons. A good military man would say, you know, something's wrong with this, and you'll see why. But at any rate, when he wrote his uh, uh, summary, a third, uh, it's a 20 page summary, there was only about three copies and it was scarce and rare. So the end result was uh, very few people had them. But this gentleman who was a preacher in West Brookfield, uh, he, uh, he got all of it. His name is Joseph Foote. And in 1828 he got a copy of Wheeler's narrative, but he only got half of it. Most people didn't have the complete copy. And I got the letter here from the fellow who rounded up and gave me the rest, and thank goodness, because that made this available to many, many more people to study and read and understand. And here's the letter on July 16, 1829. Dear sir, I intend to send you an imperfect copy of the narrative of Captain Thomas Wheeler, which I promised you sometime since. As the whole is not printed, I have copied the remaining and closing part from one of my in my possession, which renders it complete. So he's getting a complete copy. If anything, I can aid you in compiling the history of your town, I should be so much pleased to do so. Lemuel Shattuck. So now we have a complete copy of 
wheel of surprise as he wrote it. And this is really, really important things to know because it gives you all the details in intimate detail. It's the things he left out that created the mystery. <clears throat> well, anyway, uh, he got promoted. Uh, we're talking about our, our, our wonderful friend, Putnam. And uh, we're going to move ahead now. Now, just bear with me because I want to bring you up to date on what the militia is doing in the small town of Brookfield. Why Brookfield's sitting here. Brookfield's incorporated. Actually, people were living here in 1660. They were living up on uh, what's called Foster Hill. For you people who aren't uh, knowledgeable, Foster Hill is, is a, a, a splendid hill in, uh, in East Brookfield, uh, West Brookfield. And that's where the original town occurred. Uh, higher. The other half was over in Brookfield. Uh, and there's a wonderful map up here uh, made by myself and Chuck Pritchard uh, that the Historical, <laughs> Historical Society has for sale. It shows the original town and the attack on a fortified house. So consequently, uh, here we have Brookfield. They need the sanctuary. And this is rare in Massachusetts. They, they allow the town without a uh, seated minister. That's a man who had been to college and been ordained. They allowed that. They made a provision that he had to have, they had to have one in a very short period of time, which unfortunately, during this first settlement, they never did. But, but here was the sanctuary. So people coming from the furthest west town in Massachusetts uh, to Boston, uh, excluding the Connecticut River Valley, it was a site 30 miles from there, day and a half travel. You couldn't ride much by wagon on the roads ahead then, I want to assure you of that. And then from this town to the Connecticut River Valley towns, Hadley and Springfield, it was another 30 miles. But the important thing was that you didn't have that 60 odd miles of wilderness where they had um, Indians of all sorts, uh, Rumors had all kinds of animals uh, never never inhabited this continent, but they believed they might be here. You know, we never really had any tigers, but this this article written where tigers were laying in wait for people. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, there, there was a real fear, and people didn't want to wander into the wilderness. The military hesitated to go, and they were armed, not very well. And I'll get to that because that's part of the disaster story. <laughs> Well, with that in mind, I'm going to start to break it down and show you what I came up with. Now, some of the folks here won't agree with me, and they're going to tell you that on your tour. All I ask is to keep an open mind, and when you're done, agree with me. <laughs> so with that... I'm going to drop this map here show you. This is New Braintree, and there's several new things in here uh, that I worked on. Now, is Jeff Fisk here by any chance? He is not. Okay. Uh, what I wanted, this is for Jeff Fisk. I wanted him to know that the old road, and he probably knows this now, came over Foster Hill uh, and crossed Coy Brook at the foot. And where it crossed Coy Brook, the stones from the original bridge still set in the stream. He came out, there's actually a dirt road leading to 67, right by Calvi's farm. And if you cross the road and go across that field, you'll find culverts in the field. Farmers don't put culverts in their field. People who make roads put culverts in their field. They went up diagonally. Just before Jacob Knight's place, there was an old road, clearly shown on this map. You follow that through, that comes to Shea Road. Now, this is an important part of our story. This is why I'm giving this to that this gentleman wrote a fine book on this and he's saying he's writing another one. So anyway, this is what you see here. A dotted line. I'm going to leave these maps up for in case anybody who wants to come in close and look at them. This is the dotted line that leads up through uh, the areas that I just told you. And by coincidence, it runs nearly parallel with a line of areas that different people thought that this uh, event occurred. And I'll expand and go into that for you. Now, when the militia arrived in Brookfield, uh, they arrived on August 1st, 1675. Now, the militia, and you have your, your notes there, the militia had two captains. Captain Hutchison was a representative of the general court. He was going to negotiate with the Indians, try to convince the Nipmucks not to join the Narragansett 
in a war against the English. The, uh, uh, Ephraim Curtis, who eventually became the first settler at Worcester, Mass., he uh, was going to be the interpreter. There were three Indians uh, from, uh, from the East, George Memeco and uh, Samson and Joseph Robin. They have another name. It's on your sheet. Uh, Indians change names frequently. Uh, and then they had 20 mounted horsemen. On top of that, when they were going into Minnesota, the three selectmen in town were going to go with them. And because they were so confident they were going to meet with this Indian chief, Kanawasco, who they called David. He was a Christian Indian. He believed in the same God that we do. That they went unarmed, and they convinced the militia when they stopped, and I'll give you this detail in a minute, to go further. Actually, Kanawasco was over on South Pond, so he was several miles away at Camp Hobaduck with his followers. But at the uh, camp, uh, in the direction they were going, uh, they had another chief, and he was a little different. His name was Mitam, and he has several other pronunciations to that. And he's a gentleman that destroyed Brookfield, and he's a gentleman that went on uh, to destroy Lancaster uh, the following February. They didn't meet the one they wanted to meet. They ran into the troops of uh, the one that they really weren't worried about because they weren't thinking about him. So anyway, Ephraim Curtis met with the Indians on August 2nd. The militia wrote, arrived in Brookfield August 1st. And they met with them on August 2nd. They went to a field three miles away. Now the general idea the people thought was that they went to Lake Wickabog. But if you draw a line from Brookfield and you scribe a circle and you follow the old road, this actually a field. And the only field that seems to meet this qualification up between Shea Road and uh, Madden Road. And it's a perfect field up there, the right distance from the town. It's also on the old road uh, that came through. John Bradford describes it in, in 1640. Later it was called the Old Bay Path because by that time we had a new Bay Path. So anyway, now people are going to start to raise theories. Where did this happen? Because we don't know. We're going to start with where it says number one here. I haven't blown up map here, number one. So I'm going to tell you on each one of these why I do not believe this is uh, a correct place and why I think the uh, author of this idea was incorrect. First and foremost, Captain Wheeler. Now we go to the man who was there, who wrote a summary. Now a lot of other people living about that time had different ideas, and different summaries, and different certain things happened in certain ways, and we're looking at it from different points of view and from different positions. Captain Wheeler was there. And he says, they went to a, a, a field three miles from town. So it makes sense they followed the old road, and it comes out almost exactly to the field. The Indians weren't there. The Indian guides uh, tried to persuade them to turn back. This didn't look good. But the three select men from Brookfield were so convinced they were going to meet David, Kanawasco, and they had nothing to fear that they urged them to go on. And indeed, the militia went on. And they rode on, and, and uh, the good captain says, uh, that uh, the day before he had met the Indians at an island eight miles from Brookfield. Well, I have to find the island. Heaven knows I hope everyone has lost as I am. Valley. So you see this, this uh, uh, remarkable change that happened there. Something else happened to it, I'll get to that. But where do you find the island? Raise the water level, whack to where it was 
That's land. And it's approximately, it's approximately four acres. You'll notice it's right in the bend of Slane Road. Road. So with that, we find the island. That's the only island northwest of Brookfield. And that's what the report says. It was northwest of Brookfield, eight miles. That, that island is eight and one-tenth miles along the old road in the town of Brookfield. So that identifies the island. This is where the group were heading. They were heading to that island. When Wheeler writes that they had to travel single file through a defilade or, or a section where the brush in a rocky hill rose to his right, and it was a hideous swamp to his left. So this is the choice to going down that very narrow valley. Now I'm going to branch back to where different people have different views. This is a, jo Josiah Temple wrote a history of North Brookfield, which included all of the Brookfields in the first section of it. Uh, and he wrote that in 1887. Now he was a preacher. We, uh, in our story here, we have uh, one preacher and two doctors giving their opinion. Uh, I'm not... Downing, I'm just saying they had a lot of help. They had a lot of people working for them, and they took different points of view. Took the best one and wrote it down in this book. So that's their solution. And he puts a spot right under the New Brain Tree line. It's a little over five miles from the center of town, but Wheeler said they went a total of eight miles. And my measurements make it eight and a quarter. So Wheeler and I agree. They said they had a steep hill. The hill at this site, and that's going to be the site you see today, Joseph Temple site, the hill there is uh, a little over 50 feet in elevation. Now it's steep, but it's 50 feet in elevation. Stop and think of that. 50 feet, a horse running up 50 feet can get away fairly easily, compared to what I'm going to tell you later. So with that... I'm going to try not to have a disaster here. With that, I'm going to go to the second site. This is site number two. Now, we had a Dr. Roy, who professed that he wasn't a historian, but he worked very hard. He wrote a couple of books about Brookfield. Thank goodness he did, because he brought people's attention to this very important little community who played so much in the history of New England and the history of our country. So therefore, it deserved recognition, and he, in turn, provided it the information to stimulate people and students to, uh, to begin to learn what was here and why it was here. Anyway, here's the site. Now, true enough, it's got a swamp. True enough, it's got a hill, but it's got a hill even less than the first site. It's only 50 feet. The other one might have been 10 or 15 feet higher. It's 50 feet high. Again, too, it's not a very much of a uh, problem for horsemen. And another thing, uh, Mr. Bob Ackerman, who helped me with some of the things I'm going to show you, uh, and his son, who's now chief of police of Brookfield, went with me and with our metal detectors and a reporter, and we screened that entire valley. We spent a half a day screening that entire valley. We found some modern chain, and we found a modern ox shoe, and nothing else. As far as I'm concerned, there weren't five horses killed or eight men killed there. There should have been something remaining, and there was not. So with that in mind, I disqualified that. I said, that can't be. And I move on to the next site. Now, you remember I talked about Rufus Putnam? I'm wrestling with this. This is a last-minute deal here. Remember I mentioned Rufus Putnam? Rufus Putnam came up with a site, which is right here. Right there. It's right at the section where uh, Slane Road takes a sharp left bend and McKay Road continues on. At the time this map, McKay Road was not a road. It was a, just a, a cart path leading to a house at the end of the, uh, uh, end of the land. That was as late as 1937. So anyway, 
This is where he said, we found some things here. And I'll tell you about that in a few minutes. Now, Wheeler. Wheeler says that he moved into the valley uh, 65 rods. Now, he, remember, there's 29 horsemen. So I allowed uh, 15 feet for each man and horse with space between. He moved into the valley, which meant that he went uh, a total of uh, 1,050 feet. Now, if you look at this map and get, get a closer look up close, uh, the green stripe represents exactly 1,050 feet. Now the horsemen proceeded into this valley until they encountered the Indians. And he says that they went into the valley uh, 26 rods, which translates into 435 feet. So on top of the green, you can see the white. That represents the column of troops. So you can see where they were spread uh, along that route. Up closer, you'll get a better idea of what happened. Now when you visit that site today, it's not gonna look like all the things that I told you about. Because this is gonna be Slane Road, makes a right turn and crosses, this used to be the island. You can't find an island there any longer because there's a causeway that runs across and the island has now become part of the causeway. Causeway continues on the other side since Slane Road was uh, put into it. But you'll come across two racetracks on the west side of the road. Very impressive, down in the valley, very impressive racetracks. Well, after the war, a gentleman got a second World War tank and he put a blade on it and he bulldozed the mountain on this side. He actually moved 350,000 yards of material across the road and down into the valley. Now, at Metamesson, we had five horses and we had eight men killed. There has to be some remains. I suggested a big part of those remains might be buried under there, but there are other places. Well, for clarity, you see what it looked like, all the hills and what have you. Clarity, this white section is all the material that has now been bulldozed away. Can you see that? Okay, and you're going to see that. There's going to be a house sitting back in here. This helped to destroy it, but the chain of evidence leads right to that pit. And I'll get to that at the end of this talk. Another thing that when I was mentioning these first two sites, one and two, Wheeler said the roundabout way they went back to Brookfield. But if they did a roundabout way, they would have had, had to have gone five miles north, uh, five miles west, and then five miles south to try and connect with the old military highway. They'd have done a whole variety of things that isn't even sensible. However, the last spot that Rufus Putnam selected uh, when I show the, you their escape route, it comes out pretty close to 10 miles, so it's pretty close to what Wheeler said. So I'm going to leave it up to you to decide uh, what happened there. Dr. Page. Dr. Page, much later, uh, located the farm, and he said that he thought that it happened here. Real close to where we're talking about it was the end of what is now, McKay Road now takes a sharp bend and uh, turns to the east. If, as you travel down that road, if you run into that very sharp bend, that is the site he said it happened. There are several reasons why that is not practical. One, it's a mile beyond the eight mile limit, and it's a mile closer to the huge Indian camp at Metamesset. This is the Indian camp at Metamesset that may have housed as many as 3,000 people. They obviously were not gonna, the Indians were not gonna let the militia get that close to their people. Not unless they had a suitable barrier to prevent that. But it had to be, uh, it had to be a, a bait. And the bait was the island and the people that talked to them were willing to, uh, were willing to negotiate. So consequently, here we have all these situations. What happened here? Uh, the, uh, the monument, 
the wheel of the town. Good people in town. The brain, you put a monument down on that road many, many, many years ago. And sometime a little later on, a gentleman came along. And he said, well, we don't get much traffic on that road. I'm going to move it. And so the selectman in uh, Hardwick, actually he lived in Wheelwright, said that he went down with his horses, grabbed the hold of the monument, and he carried it across Slane Road and up the hill, and he put it right in front of his house. <laughs> and it sat there ever since until the Historic Society and uh, uh, just, I believe, last year, uh, went over and they looked the situation over. They wanted to put it over there. The owner had some uh, problems. Some of the people on the board had problems, so they put it in a very nice spot. And if you go there, the only problem is you're on the opposite side of the valley that Wheeler was on, but you look down into Minnemesset Valley and you look down into the proximate site of where it happened. So it was well placed and it was well done considering it was a compromise. So my compliments to you folks for doing that. Now, uh, the Indian camp. Just the end of Sloan Road, you come to uh, uh, Ravine Road. And there's also a little monument there because uh, in February of 76, uh, the same Indian chief, Meetong, that destroyed Brookfield, also was a general who destroyed uh, Lancaster. And uh, the Rollinson garrison was a garrison house. And a garrison house, for you people who may not be familiar with this, a garrison house is a house where people would know ahead of time where to go in case of an attack. And usually they would have some sort of supplies, possibly more ammunition. <coughs> and usually the bottom 30 inches of the house had sometimes vertical logs split in half and interlaced one on the other so that you had mass to stop the uh, bullets from coming through. Uh, when they attacked Brookfield, the Indians were using tactics that were not common to Indians in North America. They took a wagon, they were up on a hill at a barn from where the fortified house was, and in that fortified house, uh, there were actually 99 people in the office. Uh, they had you know, the people from the town who escaped there. All of them didn't make it, but the ones that escaped there. Uh, and the, what was left of the militia who came back to town through this roundabout route, and they were there. <coughs> so you had 99 people there. Time for a little uh, story. I was giving a tour of the uh, original town site, and a little boy kept raising his hand and raising his hand. He was very attractive. I kept forgetting what I was doing. And he said, you said it was the dog days in August. It was awful hot, and you had, you had all those people in the house. And I said, yeah. He says, well, could you tell me, mister, it must have stunk in here, didn't it? <laughs> you know, out of the mouth of babes, I'm telling you. <laughs> so now he's giving me something to mention from his own talks. Uh, that little boy's a big man now. But at any rate, uh, the Indians uh, used wagons, wheel box wagons, loaded with hay, and, and uh, the breathing would burn. And through a series, they added to the tongue of that until gradually they wheeled it down against the fortified house. They had one difficulty, though, with their flame arrows. They couldn't get close enough to the fortified house to shoot the arrows in, so they made another vehicle. And that had a wooden front. So it gave them a shield. And then some of them wheeled it down while the men with the fire arrows were behind the shield, and they were able to fire into the wagon, and they started the wagon burning. Well, once they put it out the second time, it was starting to burn very well. And the Lord interceded, brought down a summer rain, and he got it wet, and he just couldn't get it going again. So fortunately, it saved these people, so we know what happened as a result of that. If not, that would have been a mystery among everything else. Now, I'm going to move ahead. The Indian camp is here, and it's quite clear it's the Indian camp because all along the way, I found all these assorted things for a friend of mine, assorted chips, uh, quartz, blue quartz, black plinth, all in segregated areas. You can get a definition of an outline of where certain people from Massachusetts, because the Indians, after the uh, assault on, on Wheeler and the success of that. They came from all over Massachusetts to aid now their allies. And they felt they had a winning team. And you can see where they were located, all these dotted lines. And those of you interested uh, may come up and look at this later. And what's interesting is the end of this one field, the long field, uh, right behind the marker, there were five root, root cellars now. 
For you people who don't know what a root cellar is, it's a gravel hill. They dug into the gravel hill several feet, lined it with hay, then they would put their corn in there, cover it with more hay and then more gravel, and it would stay uh, good. It, it stayed good for years. As a matter of fact, when the railroad went through in East Brookfield, they had a place called Fort Hill, and uh, the uh, Indians had a place there uh, in earlier times. And when they dug into that hill, they found baskets of short ears of black corn, still edible. And this, this was a, how many years? 100 years, 150 years later. So it goes to show you these root cellars work, and these, these Indians were really, really clever people. I'm not saying that because they might be Indians here, but I'm going to be today. Now, I'm going to come to the end of this and, and show you what we all came here to see. We find the island. From a military standpoint, what you do is you look for a place where you can set up and, and accomplish an ambush. Now remember, I'm working from Wheeler's description. There are a lot of other people who have a lot of other ideas, but there's nothing better than the person who was right there at that point in time. And he talks about going in single file. Well, we got a cornfield down here, which meant that he could, he could strategically move his troops. But as you move further and the hill got steeper, see the lines get closer together? That means the hill is getting steeper. And all on the side is a very rocky hill. You get down in the fall and you'll see that. The thing you look for in an ambush is what's called a choke point. You squeeze your enemy into the smallest possible space. So he doesn't have a broad area to attack. Well, the Indians are on both sides, concealed in the swamp, concealed in the brush on the rocky hill. Went down a little further, and we come to what's called a pinch point. That's the closest point, and they knew where this was. And it looks very much, this is before the junction of uh, Ravine Road and, uh, I'm sorry, not Ravine Road, uh, McKay Road and Splane Road. Just before that is the pinch point. And the three selectmen, undoubtedly unarmed, uh, were going ahead with one of the Indian guides because George Memento, uh, he was captured at that onslaught. The three selectmen were killed. The two captains, Wheeler and Captain Hutchison, were wounded. And five of the militiamen strung out behind him uh, were also killed, and five were wounded, and those people have a list, we'll see who they are and where they come from. The Indians, the other two Indians, uh, Joseph and Samson had warned uh, the officers, you can't go back the way you came, because Indians have worked this out pretty well, and they'll cut off your route of escape. So they turned to the Robin brothers, who helped them, and they gave them an escape route. And the Robin brothers took him in a roundabout way that the captain said would take him 10 miles from Brookfield. And coming up through Metamesa, on a bias now, right at the choke point, the troops begin to move diagonally across that hill because the horse is not going to run up a hill that is 400 feet high from the water base to the top. It's 400 feet. Now that's quite a bit of difference in 50 feet from the previous two gentlemen. So they went across this on a bias, because horses don't run very well uh, across the side of the hill because they'll have two short legs and they can't do that. Well, I put arrows here showing where they probably went. And they probably crossed the valley and came out on what's now Route 67 in North Brookfield and followed that straight through until they picked up the military highway of 1673, which is now called the New Bay Path, and that took them straight into Brookfield. And that is approximately, slightly more, but approximately 10 miles. And it meets with everything that, that the good uh, uh, captain said. Now, evidence. Up till this up till point in time where uh, I started researching this, there was no physical evidence on the ground. Evidence does it all. We have Captain Wheeler, we have all the right strategic points. Uh, we need evidence to supplement the story. So with this, I'm going to start to show you some of the evidence that came out of the ground since then. 
if we started getting the evidence in 1996 when a friend of mine and myself and another gentleman were out with metal detectors. When we got to this point, oh, about 15 feet from the junction of where Slane Road makes its turn, McKay Road, on, on the hillside, we found this. I don't know if you can see it or not. Can you see it? It's a brass buckle. Uh, and it was made in England. And it was made about this period. Now, Bob took this to several museums, several periodists, and they reviewed this and they agreed. This was a very early buckle. Now, the strange thing about it, a buckle like this turned up at the Pritchard's estate up on Foster Hill. And another one turned up over by the fortified house. Now, this is the buckle made to accept a cloth or canvas type belt. It has a flexible part. Any of you interested in that, you can come up later and look at that. This is a very appropriate buckle for the time. Here's where we found the buckle. Just off the road, just before we get to the junction. Now, if it was just a buckle, it's just a buckle. But there's a fellow by the name of Ernie Mitchell, and years and years ago he came to me and he said, you know, I've been looking for this place for years. Would you give me your idea where it is? And I did. And he went up there, and I never heard anything more about him until, oh, a year or two ago, when Bill Jenkins introduced me to him. And he says, you know, I found a horseshoe way up on the side of that hill. And I was all excited. And I showed him the map, and he says, yeah, that's where I found it. It's following this bias that I talked about. So he says, I'll give it to you. And I said, geez, that'd be wonderful if you do that. And he did. He came all the way down from Auburn one day. He came to my house and brought me this portion. Then he apologized because he had used a chemical on it so it wouldn't rust while it's wrought iron. You know, it's not going to rust anyway. It'll take uh, hundreds of years to rust. This came out of the hill right here. Before we get to the buckle, so that meant that the militia's here and it comes this way, there were other people coming up on a bias. They didn't all wait and make a turn. They all broke to the right at one time. Now here's a horseshoe. It still has a piece of a nail in it. No one in his right mind, if you go and visit that hill and knows anything about horses, is going to take a horse up that hill. There's nothing for them to see there in the first place. And uh, it's dangerous for the horse and it's dangerous for the rider. Well, a little later, <clears throat> a little later, he talks to a gentleman by the name of Gary Stiles. And uh, so he goes up there and he starts poking around. What does he find? Up on the hillside, he finds musket balls, two different calibers. I've got an M here showing where he found them, all on the same track. So now we have, from that hillside, we have one horseshoe, we have a buckle, and we have musket balls. You know, so anybody could drop musket balls up there, hunting or anything else. But when you couple it with the rest of the stuff where you wouldn't find a horse there, then it leads you to think something different happened here. So then, after all of this occurred, I decided to go up and follow my thoughts on this. When I got to this section, just before the section where the man had bulldozed it out, I found a horseshoe, which meant that probably a lot of the artifacts are down in that racetrack. Here's the horseshoe that I found. Now, I want you to know, the question was asked by people in the brain, you're going to expect to find horseshoes on a horse farm. Well, it was a horse farm since after 1946. These are made of wrought iron. We didn't make a wrought iron horseshoe in, in America since the best we made is open heart. Except for a few people who might have used up this stock. This is not common. This is not common in recent times. Therefore, very much in line with this being evidence on Wheeler's skin. So now, I'm very short of time now because I was only given an hour. So I want to ask, does anybody have any questions they would like to ask? Because this is your last chance. 
And then you're going to go and be massacred, I think. <laughs> yes, sir. He referred to the Indians as Indians. There were Nipmucks, yes, and there were there were Quabogs or a whole variety of, of different tribes. They came down from, from uh, what is now called Northfield. They came down and joined in. And uh, by the time that they got to the fortified house after this attack, um, the estimates of the people that were within the building was uh, at least 300 Indians had circled, cir uh, had circled the uh, fortified house. Unfortunately, the closest they could get to it was the huge rock on the hill. And if you visit the site, you'll see it up on the hill. And that was uh, 80 yards from the well behind it, and it was close to 100 yards from uh, the, uh, where the fortified house itself was. Uh, the rest of them, they, they were shooting Kentucky windage. And you could see where the balls actually went over the house and hit the bank. It's a bank on the side, and buckets of balls came out of that, uh, out of that uh, section. Now, I wanted to tell you one last thing, because we sent those men in there deliberately and knowingly with uh, improper equipment. The Indians were far better equipped than the settlers. The Indians were clever enough to know uh, that uh, you know these people had horses. They did not. They weren't allowed to have horses. The reason being we had mobility. They did not. We did a lot of hateful things to the Indians. A lot of hateful things. And this is not what I'm up here to tell you today. My mother was an Abenaki, Eastern Abenaki, so I have feelings both ways. But the fact remains that those men who went into that valley with weapons that were snap hands, and I have evidence in Bodge's book here, with snap hands. I beg your pardon, with matchlocks. They went in with matchlocks. Matchlock is a musket where you pull the trigger and a long arm comes down with a fuse, touches a pan, and ignites the powder, which causes the weapon to go off. They have a fuse wrapped around them. An expert that had written several books up at Higgins Armory a few years ago said that often the length of this cord, it, was, it varied, but it would be anywhere from 20 to 30 feet. Uh, and it was had saltpeter and it would burn relatively slow, but it would burn nonetheless. So troopers did not keep all of their fuses burning at one time. Only in a time of threat would they all light up. And then they had to light up one from the other. Because to strike a spark and start a fuse is, is, is a laborsome thing. And you certainly didn't do that on horseback. So they had to light their fuse from another man whose fuse was lit. And he said about 25% of the troopers kept their their, their fuse is burning at one time. And then they would swap off so that he wouldn't use up all his fuses at the end of the day and have nothing left to defend himself. And uh, they would swap off and light someone else's fuses. And this is how it was going. And I have reason to believe because of the disaster, and there isn't a lot of reports of Indian dead from the people that were there, um, the uh, gentlemen were ill-prepared and there might have been as few as a half a dozen rifles that were capable of firing back. Now this is this is startling. Bodge writes an ex excellent thing. I won't bore you by reading it. But just before this happened, the Massachusetts Bay ordered uh, 500 snap hands, which are early flintlocks, which are very efficient weapons. A piece of flint, you don't have a fuse. You just charge the pan, pull a hammer back, and load it from the trigger. Even in the rain, if you use a piece of leather to cover it, you can continue to use that. It's awfully hard to work with a fuse item in the rain, keeping the fuse protected and burning, put powder in, and it's also very dangerous because you're putting powder in or a weapon and you're holding on in. If you have to sort of the to follow, and in the excitement, it's hard to believe that if they did that, they would have blown themselves up. So with that, uh, anyone else have any questions? Yes, sir. Well, they, they started out we don't know precisely when it happened, but they started out uh, and they went to uh, the field three, three miles away. And they stayed there for a period of time, waiting for the Indians to meet with them, which Ephraim Curtis said they had agreed to do. Now, it didn't happen that way. The Indians didn't show up. And that's why the selectmen urged them to go on uh, up further. They were going to go up to the island, or it seems they were going to go up to the island. And uh, consequently, uh, they, uh, that's when they met their, met their doom. Uh, so consequently, it's hard to tell you exactly what time of day, but it was time of day enough so that they got back to the fortified house before dark. The one story that, that tells you the magnificence of the colonial women 
uh, on the eastern part of town, there were, there were actually uh, three houses, a mile, slightly more than a mile from the rest of the town. Uh, that was in what is now Brookfield. And there was one lady, their name was Trumbull. And uh, her husband was a traveling man, and he had gone to, to uh, Springfield on an errand for somebody else. Surprisingly enough, he was bringing back liquor. But uh, at any rate, she was there alone, and the militia rode through. They came from the east, and they had to pass the road to get to the fortified house. So they told her that what was going on, and they continued on their way. Well, this lady had a one-year-old child, and a child born the day before this happened. And she had to walk more than a mile up a hill, a rather steep hill, and down Devil's Elbow, which is a rock face that makes a right angle and drops 40 degrees. And she had to walk that distance carrying those two children, and she got to the fortified house in time to be safe. So my compliments to that television woman, and several were like that. Okay, any more? Yeah, right. oh. Where is the fortified house exactly? The fortified house is on Foster Hill in Foster West Brookfield. Hill. And his big stones are there to identify the site of where it was and the meeting house and so forth. So if you take a trip up there uh, off Route uh, uh, 9, uh, you'll see the road to Boston. You'll go up there and you'll see the nice horse farm right across from that. You'll see these stones. Can I ask one more question? Yes. How did they know they were going 80 miles back in the 1600s? Did they use to measure? And, and why? It was estimates, but it's, it's terribly important how accurate they were because Woodford and Sanford made a map from Boston to Springfield in uh, 1648. And uh, they were within 10 miles of the accuracy of it. And they, I have to say they used some kind of nautical measuring in order to, to uh, uh, figure out how far it was. These people didn't do that. This is an estimate from service. How fast does a horse go? How far does a horse go? And so they estimated. So all of these times and links actually are estimated. Okay. Last. You, you should know that Trumbull's wife was Elizabeth Pritchard. Mr. Pritchard wants you to know <laughs> <laughs> that Trumbull's wife it was William Pritchard's daughter. Was, was William Pritchard's daughter. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. Anybody else?